as a church, we've been going through the gospel. We've been looking at who Jesus is and what he's done and the life of Jesus and saying, hey, what can we glean from this? What can we hear from this? How can we be encouraged? How does it challenge us? How does it lift us to be more like him? And there's a whole bunch of things that Jesus says and does that it, it just makes me go, yes, I want that in my life. Like, I need that in my life. And, and today's, again, no exception. As I opened up the gathering today, I mentioned that I'm kind of excited about today's message because it's it speaks to me. You know, I, I get to speak every Sunday morning, and I hope you guys never uh, think that on Sunday morning when I'm speaking that I'm just speaking to you guys. It's, it's encouraging me too. And this message again, I was just like, that's a good nugget. That's a, that's a really good one. I want to meditate on that. I want to think about that uh, a little bit more. But as we <coughs> opened our gathering this morning, I mentioned that we praise Jesus because of who he is. We praise that he deserves praise. Like, period. That's who he is, right? And, and today's message again points to this, this story about Lazarus being raised from the dead. Points again to Jesus, who he is. And I love how it sets up, and it, it even challenged me thinking about it, like thinking about how, how we're going to see here, that Jesus said that he loved Mary and, and Martha and Lazarus, and so he actually allowed death to happen in order for him to reveal himself to them. I, when I read, I read the verse again, I said, that's, is that what it said? I read the verse again, I'm, that's what it said, that's how it says. So the story of Lazarus, if we're a little bit unfamiliar, Lazarus was a, was a, a, a companion of Jesus. He, there's this relationship that is recorded, they know each other, there was this, this connection that they had, and, and, uh, and Jesus loved them, and he loved Mary and Martha. And in verse, uh, sorry, we're going to look at John, I didn't mention that, John chapter 11. We're going to John chapter 11, so you guys know where this story is. John chapter 11, the death of Lazarus. Um, in verse uh, 5 and, and 6, it talks about Jesus' love that he has for Martha and his sister, uh, sister Mary and Lazarus. And it says here, uh, chapter 11, verse 5 and 6, it says this, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary. This is Mary, Mary, the one that came and anointed Jesus' feet and had that beautiful worship experience at, at Jesus' feet, anointing him. And then it says this in verse 6, it says, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. That was puzzling to me. I said, well, Jesus, right? I'm, this is how I read my Bible. I get to this spot here, and I'm kind of like, this doesn't really sound right. I'm like, oh, Jesus, you love Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, you knew he was ill, and if we have gleaned anything from the stories of Jesus that we've been going over, we know that Jesus has the power to do something about this ill person. And it says here, he loved them, so he stayed where he was at for a couple days. The explanation for Jesus' waiting, the explanation for, for Lazarus' pathing is that he loved them. Wow, that is kind of, that's kind of puzzling to me. God, Jesus, you're going to have to reveal some things to me so I can understand a little bit more about what this is. What are you doing, Jesus, in this passage? What are you saying about yourself? In verse 4, it says, in verse 4, look at this. It says, Jesus heard about the sickness. He, he heard that somebody, in verse 3, sorry, it says this even. It says, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So in verse 4, it says this, This illness does not lead to death. Though in the story, right? I'm like, though in the story, it, it led to him dying. The, the death was not the goal or the point of this story. It is, look at this, what Jesus says, It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. 
know what I mean? Come on, already, I hope this is turning up some questions here, mind. I'm like, fine, so sometimes I'm going through stuff, and when I'm going through a situation, it may be something that, that it's there, it's not for myself, not, it's for the glory of the Father. There's some perspective on my life. It was more loving to put Lazarus and the sisters through death and through grief so that it would reveal more of God's glory to them. Jesus loves us not simply and only through what he does. That's what I was saying about in the psalm this morning. It's not simply by what he does, but it's by showing himself to us. God loves us not only and simply by what He does, but by showing Himself to us. See, seeing the glory of the Father, seeing the glory of Jesus, it's like the fundamental piece to the Gospel. It's not only that He came and He saved us from our sins and He does great things for us. It's not only do we get to praise Him on Sunday morning because, man, this week, it was a good week, and I saw Him all week long, and it was good, and He answered all my prayers. No, He deserves our praise, and He deserves our worship, not because of what He does, but because of His revealed self, His glory, who He is. I'm not convinced totally. I know. It was hard. I was thinking about this this week. I said, but God, I mean, you, you look at all, throughout the Bible, you're doing stuff and everybody's praising you because you're doing it. And in the Psalms, right, David reminds them all the time, this is what he did for you. Praise him. He, er, he earned it. He deserves it. But in John chapter 1, verse 14 through 16, right, it's a revelation of who Jesus is. We've got to start there. The Word, right, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, he became flesh, he became human, and he dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. In verse 11, in verse 16, then it says, From his fullness we have received grace upon grace. You need to remember that in verse 16. John chapter 1, verse 16. For in his fullness we have received grace upon grace. We understand grace, right, is the power and the desire to do the will of the Father. It's the unmerited favor of the Lord. It is His power within us to do and continue in the good works that we talked about last week that He has ordained for us to do. It's this grace in which we live the Christian walk. It is by His power within us. So it is from His fullness, verse 16, that we receive grace on grace. It's from the fullness, it's from the full revelation of Jesus that we receive the strength that we need to continue on walking towards Him. It's important. There's a pattern that we see in the Scriptures, that Jesus reveals His divine glory, His nature, His nature being like God, being the only Son of God, then we as the people of God, we behold it, we, right? it's either through Scripture or through uh, His act that we behold it, and it is from His fullness, seeing that, all of a sudden understanding it, and uh, grasping it, believing on it, that we receive grace, we receive strength to continue on. Right? This is the pattern. Jesus reveals His divine glory, whether it's through His, his spoken word, whether it's through His act and His deeds, we behold it, we see it, and then as we believe on it, in His fullness, we receive the grace to continue on. How does Jesus love us? It is through the revelation of who He is. It's through Himself. How does Jesus love us? By giving us Himself. Jesus does not mainly love us by saving us or sparing us from suffering or death or pain or agony. He mainly saves us, he mainly shows his love to us by giving himself to us. 
So that's why in all situations, in turmoil and in trouble, right, we can say we can be the most joyous people, we can be the most secure people, that the surrounding things, God doesn't promise us, again we know this, He doesn't promise us peace and blessings and everything good in our life. He says, I promise you myself. I have given you me. Don't fall into the trap of measuring how much God loves us, because I get this all the time. Fall into the trap of measuring how much God loves us by the blessings that we have in our lives. Whether it be the wealth that we have, the health that we have, the position that we have, the place that we are in life, the, the don't measure how much God, and then because Man, sometimes that turns into jealousy. Then I get, and when I fall into the trap of measuring how much God loves me uh, by how much I have in my life or how much God has provided for me in my life, then I fall into the trap of jealousy because then I look at other people and I'm like, they've got a little bit more than me or they, they've gone a little bit further than me or they don't have this trouble in my life. And then I get into a whole other issue of, of, of sin because I, I, I first started, it first started with not understanding that God love for me isn't necessarily by what how much he's done for me, but it's about who he is and who he's revealed himself to be. Before we look at our passage, we're going to get, I promise you, to John chapter 11. We're going to look at the, the story here, 17 through 44. But we gotta, I want to kind of hammer this point in a little bit more. Can you guys allow me to do that this morning? So uh, the example of God's love, when we think about what is the example of God's love, uh, and I agree with us full heartedly, and it shows in Scripture, we find in, in John chapter 3, verse 16, right, the verse that we, we all uh, know and maybe memorize when we're younger, and hey, if you haven't memorized it yet, I encourage you to keep on doing it, right? It is that God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, right, that whoever believes in Him shall have eternal life, shall not perish, right? Have eternal life. I mean, that is a statement of God's love. I love the fact when I meditate on that for myself, I said, wow, God, you, there was nothing loving in me, the Romans reveals, right? There, but you sent your son for me. You love as a demonstration of your love, right? That, that you would lay down your life. Yes. Yes and yes and yes, right? I mean, when we think about that, that, that alone, oh yes, Lord, you love me. But if we look a little bit further, that is not only what eternal life is about. The heart and the essence of eternal life. What is it? What is your love? In John chapter 17, verse 3, it says this. This is eternal life. And in eternal blessings and have everything provided for me and everything's at peace. No, this is eternal, that you may know the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom He sent. Oh, come on. All right, we can get real. I'm, I'm looking at, I, I'm thinking about my life, right? I'm thinking about the troubles I find myself in. And I said, oh God, you're a benevolent, all awesome, all great, and all powerful, all able God. I mean, like, God, eternal life, doesn't that look like God? You're eradicating everything that doesn't look like you in my life? Doesn't it look like God? Heaven on earth, right? We pray these prayers and I believe in full heart. No, Jesus said, eternal life, knowing me, being, in, being insecure in my love, is knowing me. Jesus shows up and says, this is eternal life. Never-ending knowing of God. The love of God is the gift of Himself. So then when I find myself in disarray, or when I find myself blessed, in either of those circumstances, the greatest gift of God is not what He can do for you, or not what He has done for you, but it is in knowing Himself. That's what I think about. 
think about different issues that are going on in our society right now. What could I do to help, man, the violence that is increasing in the medicine area? What, what can I do about helping stem poverty? What can I do to help people that are leaving their countries and, and coming here to the U.S.? And what can I do for all these needs that are all around me? And I think measuring last week's sermon, right? When we do good, why? For the glory of the Father. And so there's good good things that we can do to help meet needs, and, and that reveals who the Father is, but the best thing that we can do for somebody who is suffering and is need is reveal to them Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he is one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest what? Manifest what? Manifest all their needs being gone? Manifest uh, delivering them from all circumstances? Manifest by breaking down everything and making everything easy for them? No. I will love him and I will manifest myself. I will reveal who I am to them. Why? So that then they can believe on me. I will love you, and I will manifest myself to you. He loved us first. Not so that he can deliver us from all difficulties, but that he would reveal himself to us. So that in the midst of what you have and going through, Think about Mary and Martha, their brother, passing away in this passage, so that in the midst of that, they may have hope, they may have life, they may have joy, they may have guidance, they may have stability, they may have order. Right? When Jesus came to you and, and revealed, began your journey towards the cross, journey towards submitting your life to Him, He started with the revelation of who He was. As you came towards him and as you believed on him, yes, your life was transformed. And we could all spend days and hours telling of how good God was and how his, the revelation of who he was transformed our being and transformed our life. Because he loved Mary and Martha, Scripture says, he stayed for two days longer so that they could walk through the valley of death. And then he went to show his glory. I love in chapter 11 here, it had a little bit more revelation of who Jesus is and the timing of his life. In verse 7, he tells his disciples, let's go, let's get going. Let's, all right, now it's, it's time to go take the journey. And the disciples, for a moment, they were like, hey, uh, don't you know that when we're, we're going there, and those are the people that wanted to kill you. In verse 9 and 10, Jesus gives this answer. He says, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Jesus revealing his answer is really great. He says, You know what, disciples? It's not my time to die. I know that that day, the, day that, the, day, the ending of the day, it is... That have, I have an appointment on the cross, right? Jesus knew he had, he had an appointment on the cross, he had a purpose for coming. He said, and he went without hesitation because he knew, hey, this is not going to be my time. It's now time, it's now daytime, it's now time for me to reveal the glory, reveal who I am, reveal who the Father is. That's what I'm here. And so it was amazing this ability to go and say, no, this is, this is not the time. But once he gets there, and this is where our passage begins, the, 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 the message starts on page 5 of my notes. It is, it is now at this point that Jesus gets to the house and he is immediately questioned about his love. Everybody knew at this point, Jesus, the message already got to you. You waited. And so there's some questions that 
Mar Martha had, that Mary had, and, and that the mourners that were there, they were mourning uh, Lazarus' death. They're all there, and each one of them questioned his love that he had for Lazarus. Jesus, do you really love us? Maybe saying that in your life. Maybe there's been a time in your life you say that too. Uh, Jesus, do you really love us? This thing has not changed yet. Jesus, do you really love us? This has come to led to death. Je Jesus, uh, are you paying attention? Martha, here in verse twenty, uh, verse twenty and twenty-one. This is Martha coming to Jesus. He says, "So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him." But Mary remained seated in the house, and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You've been in this situation before? Find yourself something happened. Jesus, Jesus, if you would just would have intervened, Jesus, it would have been better. It would have been easier for me. Mary, she questions the same way in verse 32. Mary rises up, and in verse 32 it says, She came to Jesus and saw him. She fell to his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. The mourners again questioning Jesus' love and Verse 36, so the, verse 36, it says this, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? He loved them by not coming. Now he's questioned. And his response here, I think in his response, we can find hope and find strength and find encouragement. He first responds with a profound truth about himself. Secondly, he responds with, with strong emotions. And third, he, he responds with a powerful action. This morning I was thinking about two of them greatly. First, he, he responded with profound truth. So let's look at Jesus' response here about the truth that he reveals. In the middle of crisis, Jesus shows up and he reveals a truth about himself. In verse 21, let's look at that together. John chapter 11, verse 21 says this, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die." Yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Then he asks, Do you believe this? What is his response to Martha's question? Man, if he would have been here, he says to her, He'll rise again. And Martha, being a great, uh, you know, Jewish, she knew she knew the end. She knew there was resurrection. There was a Messiah coming. There was there was going to be a resurrection of the dead. And so she responds, "Yes, I'll take Jesus. I know, right? I know it's going to happen. And, and, and yes, God, it's going to happen." Part of part of part of our journey with Jesus and, and part of our walk with the Lord is getting things that we know in our head to be a truth in our heart. For us to believe. And I love that Jesus ended his response with her, Do you believe this? Man, brothers and sisters, right? I could call us each out. I could call these out by name. Do you believe? Jesus has revealed 
true to us. Do we believe? Martha knew that he would write again, but Jesus responds, I am the resurrection and the life. And this was a statement, this was a statement for two different, for both to Lazarus and also to Mary. It was exactly what Lazarus needed, and it was exactly what, I'm sorry, Martha, it was exactly what Martha needed in that moment. For, for Lazarus, he was saying, yes, there is a resurrection of the dead. So whoever believes in me, they will live. That's a great hope that we have as believers, that we, though we die in our flesh, there is a hope that there is an eternal life. You will rise again. You will live with Christ. We will be united together in the new heaven and the new earth. So in, in that, there is hope. There is joy. There is peace that no matter what, may happen in the flesh, oh, there's going to be a life forever united with him in eternity, knowing the Lord. But to Mary, or to Martha, sorry, there's also that same statement. Though you live, sorry, whoever, one, anyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So he's comforting Martha with this revelation about himself. I am, the re I am the resurrection and the life. Believe on me. Believe on me for Lazarus, that there is a resurrection, there is a life, because he believed on me. And for you, in your life that you live, in the daily things that you're going through, you will never die because you have been united with me, you believe in me, there is resurrection. Everyone who lives believes in me. You will not taste death. Jesus reveals himself. This is where I was talking about this week was so like, ah, uh, like profound to me, like challenging me. Because I love, I mean, come on, right? We love a good action moment of Jesus. Open the blind eye. Right? Taxes are due. Gold, the gold coin out of the fish's mouth, right? Oh, can't pitch fish all night long. Throw it on the other side. Boom, a whole bunch of fish. Oh, everybody needs food. Multiply the food. Met the need. There we go. Jesus, in the moment of, of grieving, in the moment of suffering, he, he takes this second here, and he says, this is who I am. Believe on me. It's a challenge for us in every situation that we have, every circumstance that we go through in life. Sometimes we're so eager for the answer to the prayer that we forget that Jesus is with us himself in the moment of the prayer, in the middle of the situation. Jesus reveals himself. His glory. Second thing that we see here is that Jesus shows crazy emotions. In chapter 11, we find in the middle of the response that Jesus wept. Verse 35. I love that verse, and, and, and I've heard many sermons, and maybe you have too, about Jesus' emotion in that, in that moment, and, and him, his relatability. I also love it when I look at some Greek words, and look at it a little bit, li little bit deeper than just my, my simple reading through, the, through this verse. But you know, in this verse here, there is not only a Jesus weeping over his loss, but also a irritation with the people who mourn. I'm not going to get dogmatic on this because we're talking about two words in Scripture. But when I look at that verse and I 
see these words, Jesus is actually irritated. The words that are used here, they're, they're words of irritation over the unbelief that surrounds him. And he said to them, Lord, come and see. He wept. He wept. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? And there's a weeping here in part. I think maybe, yeah, there's some, some mourning. Jesus revealing his humanity. He, he's mourning. But when we look at the words, and I look a little bit deeper, I, I can't get away from the fact that Jesus is weeping here because they still are unbelieving. Why do you still not believe? I am the resurrection and the life. I'm exactly what you've been waiting for. I'm here. Believe on me. And immediately after this, what did he say? He goes deeply moved again, deeply kind of, uh, you're looking at the, the Greek in here, he's deeply kind of irritated at everybody that's around him. And that are have all this unbelief, and he goes to the he goes to the graves, and he says, "Take away the stone." And again, one more time, are the day? Don't you know he's been dead a little while? One last resistance to God bringing this final revelation of himself. Jesus finally showing them exactly what they've been waiting for. Lord, by this time he'll speak a little bit. For he has been dead for four days at this time. Remember, he made the correction earlier in, in verse 4 of chapter 11. He says, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. They find themselves grieving in the middle, and Jesus revealed verse 40, he says this in response to Martha again. Do I, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? I am the resurrection and the life. Verse 41 and 42, let's look at the prayer that Jesus prays. Father, I thank you that you have heard me I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you have sent me. Jesus does this demonstration of power. It's all because I want them to know that you sent me. I want them to know you, God. I want them to know you. God, do it again. So that they may believe that you have sent me. Verse 43, Jesus calls out, Lazarus, come out. And in verse 44, man, it ends with, with Lazarus coming out of the grave. Rising up, he came out with his hands and his feet were bound. There's linen strips and, and they were wrapped around his face with cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and, and let him go. Jesus raised Lazarus because he is the resurrection and the life. He revealed himself. He urged belief in who he was, and he followed it up with a powerful action. All this to point, to urge those who are there, believe. Believe on me. Believe in the one who sent me. I can't remember, we, I said at the beginning, that after the fact that Jesus does it, it's really easy to be like, oh yeah, that was Jesus, praise the Lord, right? But the challenge and the encouragement for us as believers is that in the moment of his sorry, in the moment of his revelation, believe on him. Believe that he is 
who that, that he says he is. Believe that he has the power that he says that he has. And then in the midst of the thing, when we call on his name, the God in heaven, the Father, hears our voice just like he hears the voice of his Son, and he answers in power in such a way that others believe. Confirming that belief. But where does it start? Does it start with God, okay, God, do this and then I'll believe you? No, he, he said, I have revealed myself to you. Believe on me. You want some dead things in your life to rise again? You want some issues in your life to change around? And are you waiting, God, for the answer? Would you just do this one last thing? Believe on Him. Believe that He has the exact thing that you're asking for. Believe that He has the answer to the exact thing that you're looking for. Believe on Him and His revelation. And that way, if it never changes, you still have Him. But when He shows up, confirming your belief, there is praise unending because the Father has been revealed. God is saying to us this morning, I love you. I love you. And my love for you is not in sparing you difficulty. It is the gift of myself. It is the glory of the Father. And he would ask us this morning, do you see me? Do you see who I am? Do you see me for who I really am? Come to me because I have much more to show you. Anything this morning is an encouragement to us that he has it all. He longs to reveal to us through his son, through his word, that he is who he says he is. And he's asking us this morning to believe on him. Great is your love for us, God. Great is your love for us, God. That you would send your Son in the flesh to reveal to us the truth of who you are. This morning, God, I ask that you would open our eyes that we may see you. Father, not only for what you've done, but Father, for who you are. God, that in putting faith in that, in you, it's you alone. Father, I do ask that your glory would be on display in power. Father, that prayers would be answered. God, that dead things would rise. 